money to support family, and both times his fiance grew tired of waiting for him and married somebody else. Um, his father was a workman, so he's a um, um, sort of lower middle class, certainly not a wealthy man, um, but his, um, his pastor, when he was a young, when he was just eight, um, his pastor recognized his intelligence and paid for tuition to send Manuel to um, a prep school. Uh, he entered the University of Königsberg at the age of 16, studied first theology and then mathematics. Um, his undergraduate thesis was rejected, apparently because he disagreed with his teacher on some important points. Um, and this actually affected his academic career for a long time. So he spent um, um, the years, um, well, I'll skip over this a little bit, but he basically s spent the 1750s through 60s as um, first um, a private tutor and then as um, um, a lecturer, basically, um, at the university. So unless during these years, unless you had an endowed chair at the university, which Kant did not, you didn't get paid, you didn't get a salary. And so you had to work directly for your students, basically passing around a hat um, at the end of lectures to collect um, pay. Kant worked very, very hard at this. Um, he lectured many hours every day. Um, he became a very popular lecturer even though he gave his lectures starting at 7 in the morning, and students had to arrive in class at 6 in order to get a seat. So he lectured on many topics, including math and physics and cosmology and anthropology, geography, education, philosophy, and religion. Um, and this continued, his, his lectures continued right through the 1790s, all through his career. Um, the caricature again, that you might know uh, is a man who is mechanically rigid. Um, so supposedly he would wake up at five every morning, write his morning lecture, then after lecture he would return to the study and work until one in the afternoon, at which time he would have his one meal of the day and then walk around the city of Königsberg, no matter what the weather. So the story is that housewives would set their clocks according to his walk, it was always at exactly the same time, and the one day that he didn't show up on his walk, they were all sure that he was dead. Uh, in fact, the story is that he had gone to try to get news about the French Revolution. But on the other hand, he was also a very sociable man, um, and he was known, he, he had regular dinner parties and was very concerned to have the right people sitting in the right place to um, have uh, conversation. He was supposedly charming and witty, and he regularly played cards and billiards. Okay, so he continued to he published, continued to publish through the 1760s, um, and I'll give one example here of an early paper um, published in 1763 called The Only Possible Basis for a Demonstration of the Existence of God. Um, okay, so we've talked a little bit in this class about the reception, talked about the reception of the new natural sciences that by this time had been around 100, 150 years or, or whatever. Um, and we talked a little bit about the growing reliance on reason uh, in philosophy. Uh, and one of the central questions of the day one of the ways that reason and the powers of reason was considered was whether reason alone uh, could produce substantive knowledge. And this dispute about the powers of reason alone took different forms, one of which concerned the proof of the existence of God. Whether there could be a rational in reason alone, a rational demonstration of God's existence, or whether God's existence could only be established on the basis of faith. 
So the um, relation, the, the power of reason was debated in terms of um, the demonstration of God. So uh, in the mid 18th century, what we're talking about here, um, maybe the leading defender of the rationalist approach that reason <coughs> could generate knowledge, substance knowledge, um, was Christian Wolff, who was a follower of Leibniz. Um, and these rationalists thought, these rationalists thought that maybe the principle of non-contradiction by itself, maybe together with the principle of sufficient reason that everything has uh, an explanation, a rational explanation, these alone were enough to establish um, substantive knowledge. So Kant's early work was part of this rationalist tradition. Part of this rationalist tradition. So in this work, for example, he argued that although previous rationalist attempts to establish God's existence failed, uh, he thought there was another way of proving God's existence based on the claim that God is the necessary ground of real existence as opposed to merely logical existence. Merely possible. Okay, um, so the power of reason alone and whether reason alone can establish substantive knowledge. Um, one way, so, so I need to introduce a little bit of vocabulary here. Um, in terms of uh, different kinds of knowledge, or the source or justification of different kinds of knowledge. So um, what's called a priori knowledge is supposed to be, well, what's the a priori knowledge? Some of you, I'm sure, have heard this term before. Yeah. Um, something that's not based off of experience. Right. Something, that, so if it's knowledge, it's something that we can know without basing that on experience. So mathemat mathematics is um, a good example here, where we can know things in mathematics um, that, that what? So if this is supposed to be a priori, it's supposed to somehow not be based on experience. So we have to be a little bit careful here about what it means to be based on experience. Uh, it can't be that what babies are born knowing mathematical truths from the moment they're born before they have an experience. And that can't be. I mean, you go to school to learn math. So, how should we understand this? Yeah. Without direct reference to experience? Direct reference to it. What do you mean by that? Um, <clears throat> by say that it's cloudy outside, you have to directly look outside and see if it's cloudy. If I say 2 plus 2 is 4, and you know what 2 means, you know what plus means, you can just do it in your head without having direct reference to experience. 2 plus 2 is 4, work out your head and say 2 plus 2 is 4. Okay, okay so, the, so the looking outside is supposed to be empirical now. So empirical knowledge is supposed to be based on experience. That's the contrast. So if, uh, right, so babies aren't born knowing that 2 plus 2 is 4 because they might not know what 2 or 2 or plus or 4 mean. Um, but maybe once we know the terms involved, then what? Then you can figure out in your head without directly referencing something else. Okay, so then we can figure it out. That means we can offer a reason for believing. We can offer a justification for this kind of knowledge. And the justification doesn't depend on experience, it doesn't depend on empirical sensation. Um, so, Right, so the claim that 2 plus 2 is 4 is, sorry, the claim that 2, two plus 2 is 4 is a priori means that we can offer a justification for that without the justification drawing on experience. In contrast, uh, whether, so the knowledge that it's cloudy outside 
does depend on our experience. Um, there's no way of justifying that without some kind of reference to sensation or experience um, about, the, about the world. Okay, so basically, um, rationalists thought that we could get substantive knowledge, substantial knowledge, based on reasoning alone, based on a priori reasoning alone, without having to draw on um, experience. Empiricists, on the other hand, thought that all real knowledge, all substantive knowledge, came from sensation. It, it can be justified only in terms of empirical observation. Um, Okay, last point, um, I want to introduce these terms also. So analytic statements and synthetic statements. Um, so everybody agrees that, well, if they accept this distinction, everybody agrees that so-called analytic statements can be known to be true or false a priori. So one way to think about this is that analytic statements you might think of as being true or false by definition. So if you know the meanings of the terms, you'll be able to figure out whether they are true or false without experience, a priori. So if I tell you that all triangles have three angles, and you know what the term triangle means, you'll know that that's true. Because the idea of having three angles is contained analytically in the idea of a triangle. Um, so that's something that you can know a priori. You don't have to say, well, I've seen 47 triangles in my life, and all of them have had three angles, and so I bet the next one's going to have three also. And you don't have to draw an experience that way. On the other hand, if I say dogs usually live longer than cats, you can know the meaning of the term dog, and you can know the meaning of cats and what it means to live, and, but you're not going to be able to figure out a priori whether that's true or not. You need to draw on experience. Okay, last point. So, sorry, so that's an example of a synthetic claim because the, what's being claimed is not contained in the meaning of the terms themselves. Different meanings are being combined somehow claim is that different meanings go together. Well, what about this? Through the vertex of a triangle, there's exactly one line parallel to the base. So, so through the, this vertex of that triangle, there's one line parallel to that line. Okay, well, that is not obviously an analytic statement. You might know the meaning of the term triangle and parallel and vertex, vertex without knowing whether that's true. So it doesn't seem to be analytic. On the other hand, that's a mathematical truth of Euclidean geometry, something that we can know a priori. So there's a question here about how that kind of knowledge is possible. How is it possible to have Synthetic claims, substantive knowledge, not like triangles have three sides, that can be known a priori. So that kind of substantive mathematical knowledge is a big question for Kant. And that's what we'll start talking about next time.